I'm just going to restart the recording. So that... Anyway, this one I thought was pretty awesome. This thread, um, I didn't know this. The smart TVs, I haven't had a TV in a long time, but apparently smart TVs now are tracking everything you do. And they're, um, which I didn't realize, but here's all the trackers in the Amazon Fire TV and the Roku. And he found like more than 50 trackers in some channels and they're sending your Mac address and they're sending everything about you unencrypted over the internet. And I thought I thought was even more fun is there's one of them that has a uh, privacy option. Yeah. Roku has a limit ad tracking option, and if you turn that on, it tracks you more, which is what I would expect. And they had three different research groups that wrote devices to automatically tune into everything and watch TV and then track the ads, and they found that they're all tracking you like crazy. And this is, in fact, someone, Liz said, I talking about this morning, she said, this is why TVs have gotten cheaper, because they call this after-sale monetization. Now, the TV is an ongoing source of revenue for them, and so they don't have to charge you for the TV. Really, they'd probably like to pay you to put a TV in your house because now they can keep making more money off you forever. Like a free search engine. Well, I guess so. Yeah, like a free search engine. Anyway, um, so that's pretty interesting. And, I, and there is a movement of California privacy law and in other states trying to pass a law to limit how much of this you can do without telling people, without getting their consent and all that. And we'll see. I like the idea of the because it's like, it's like playing Yes, it is. Anyway, so now uh, the president wants to find a whistleblower, so Andrew, internet sleuths are trying to find the whistleblower, and yesterday he said that, that there will be a civil war if people try to impeach him, and so, you know, as he's doing the same thing he always does. He's mobilizing his legion of radical supporters to uh, do crazy things, and they are, of course, going to be doing it, so we'll see how much they take revenge on. This was pretty awesome. Um, the... The Federal Election Commission has been completely helpless for like three years because they need to have four members to actually do anything, and they were lowered to three, and now one of them wanted to publish some guidelines, and the chairperson took down the website, said you cannot put them on the website, um, so she just put it on, on Twitter. There's a long tweet stream publishing her new statement about uh, prohibited activities involving foreign nationals, which her boss didn't want her to publish. He said, well, I don't like being muzzled, so I'm just going to put it on Twitter instead of on the official FEC website, so now it's out there. And uh, so you're obviously getting some rebellion in there. Anyway, um, ransomware is unbelievable. 95 million for a Danish company. And another company just went out of business, a hospital just went out of business entirely after a ransomware attack. So yeah, they're just closing permanently. They can't figure out how to recover. And they said 500 schools have been hit by ransomware this year so far. So in the United States? Yes, I think so. Uh, although I'm not sure. It might be worldwide, but I think they're at least mostly in the United States. So that's pretty impressive. And apparently Docker is going broke, which is not too surprising because they never actually figured out how to charge for their service. They had the free service, and then they planned to make money off of the Swarm service, but Swarm was made obsolete by Kubernetes, and their, their sort of half-hearted attempts to make a pay version have never really worked out, which is true of an awful lot of internet businesses. They make a free thing, they get a lot of buzz, and they say, well, we'll make money later, and Often that later does not come. So when a neighbor approaches he uses it, um, Toby, and uh, he swears by it. I think that containers and Docker's is not as isolated from the host OS as is virtual machines. It's not. That's the point. It's much faster and smaller, but it is less right. separated from the host, and it's considered less secure, but much more efficient. You're sure that uh, the host resources. That's why. They're That's right. Yeah. It's a, yes. Anyway, so uh, I'm talking about this assembly stuff today, and let me just go to my, um, uh, where is it? Here we go. I'll just go to my cloud machine, and my session ended. No oh, C yes, that's right, because what's that? The no seed constructs? That's what this is, yeah. And so um, the City College blocks RDP, so i got to run a VPN. So be aware of that if you're on college. Uh, they don't. Viper will do. Okay, there we are. I have a VPN. All right. Yes. And they don't block VPN, so the City College is less uh, vigorous than the Great Firewall of China. There we are. So now I have a VPN. Now I should be able to connect to my cloud machine. There we are. All right. That's a good idea to use a VPN anyway, but I usually don't bother unless it, it blocks something. 
But I did get hacked that way, so it would be a good habit to always use the VPN, really. Anyway, all right, so here's my cloud machine, and we'll talk about these things. I'll close that if I can. Let me make this a little smaller. There we go. All right. So I'm ready to show you this. All right, so let's talk about C constructs. And you can do it all in a cloud machine. Now, I should mention the projects are in a state of some confusion because I'm updating them to the cloud. And this will be an ongoing process. So I'm hoping to just have everything in the cloud-based version. Here's some of the old ones down here in legacy. And here's ones that work the same in cloud and local. And I just moved two of them down there, 301 and 304. I figured out how to run Jasmine in the cloud machine, which turned out to be very easy. And I got this Ida Pro one down here, a 304. That's actually the wrong title. This is the one where you recognize C constructs in assembly. I'll have to fix this title later. But this is the one that is the main point of this lecture. And so what you have to do is have Ida Pro installed, any version, and then you make this program called print. So let's take a look at that. Um, if I go here on my cloud machine, I can close all this junk. If it's going to, there we are, it's moving a little bit. All right, there we are. Okay, let me see if I can keep getting rid of windows that are in the way. All right. And now we're back to basically good old MS-DOS from the old days, which is where I highly recommend doing this. You run, you open the developer command prompt for Visual Studio, which we talked about before. Uh, for some reason, Microsoft wants you to open a special window for doing this, I assume, so you have the right uh, um, system variables and such to make it work. And I made a couple programs here. So let's start with the simplest program I could think of, which is print. So if I notepad print.cpp, all right. And let me make the font bigger. Yes. All right. It is very slow, but it'll do. Okay. So this is the, that's why I love this. Now that I have this Microsoft command line compiler in Visual Studio, it's very much like GCC. And now you can write really simple little programs like this. This is C++ instead of C. And the only difference for what we're doing is you have to do this using namespace standard stuff up here and a different name of the library, but it amounts to the same thing. And now this just prints hello. That's all it does. Prints a decimal and then a string. Uh, and printing out hello. So there it is, and that, I compiled that earlier with the same old way. It's easy enough to do. And if you run that, of course, it doesn't do much. It just prints out one line. It has two and then hello on it. And what's interesting to us is not that program doing that, but understanding how that works in assembly language. And we've already done it for Linux, and of course, it's very similar for Windows. So you open up IDA, and you open up the compiled version of that program, which is a new file, and I'm putting it in, well, I don't even, I think I put it in C decomp there. Okay. There it is, print.exe. All right. And then it asked me a lot of questions. I just ignore them and take the defaults. Okay. And here we are. It's opened, but it's not really ready yet. The color bar is still changing at the top. Now it's finally done, and it shows me this garbage which, as I mentioned, is one of the irritating things about IDA. It will always show you something completely useless when you open it, some kind of useless preloading thing that's part of the operating system, not the actual code that is worth looking at. To find the code that's worth looking at, the only way I know how to do it is view toolbars strings, or uh, no, it's not view, it's something else. Let me go here. Um, it's... View open subviews strings, okay? View open subviews, okay, strings. Here's strings, okay, there's strings, all right? And then it puts the real useful strings like hello always right at the top. So you double click that, and that takes you to where the string hello is stored, and then you go to the data xref, and double click that, and now you've finally gotten to the actual code that does something. And let me see if there's some way to make this look bigger. 
but I think especially for the video, that's no good. Let's see if there's options, font size or something. Um, font, ooh, that would be nice. All right, let's just try something bigger. Anything bigger and see if it actually does something. Oh, it actually did something. All right, good. Neat. So let me see if I can grab some part of this window. Okay, there we are. So uh, this does not have all the extra stuff like the addresses and the raw code bytes. This just shows that it, the place it starts is 40, 40 401,000. And remember I said Windows programs always think they're at 401,000. They always think they loaded at 400,000. They have different segments. And the text segment starts at 401,000 because that's a virtual address. And here's all the code. This is, as it ought to be, an incredibly simple program. This push EBP and move EBP to ESP is just how you create a new stack frame. Remember, the, um, at the end of the current stack frame is the stored EIP, and that is put there by the calling function, which in this case would be a Windows function launching it. And once you're in there, the first thing you do is save the old EBP, and then you move um, EBP into ESP. Or, anyway, you, you're creating a new stack frame here. I'm not sure which way this goes. Um, here, now I can find, this is what I always have to do. I have to find a string that refers to a fixed value, and then I can figure out what's going on. So it is move the thing on the right to the thing on the left, because there's two different versions of assembly language, and I'm not smart enough to remember them. So now I know this is moving ESP into EBP. So this takes the current top of the old stack and makes it the bottom of the new stack, and that's how you create a new stack frame. Then usually after this, you'll see, um, all right, so now we push stuff and push, we're adding stuff onto the stack. So we put the string on the stack, we put the, the two on the stack, and now you can call some kind of variable. And this is a local thing, 401060, but that presumably will eventually go to uh, print, a system call of print. And so this is pushing the arguments on the stack, hello, and then the two, and then the format string, and those are the three arguments for that print command. So all of this stuff here, these, this assembly language here, I wonder if I can, yeah, it looks like I can highlight it. All this assembly language there, four, code, four lines of code. I'm going to click somewhere to clear it because it comes unreadable in the room. That is one call, one line of C. That is the line of C that did the printf. This line right here, printf, format string two and hello. This is going to require three arguments to get pushed on the stack and then the call to the subroutine. So that's what you see here, three pushes and a call. So that's all. All right. And let me go to my slides and see if there's anything else worth saying about this. I think not for that one. All right, so you go through this junk, how to find IDA Pro. And when you're done, there it is. That is the four lines of assembly code required for one line of C. And it's pretty easy to understand once you get it. You can also notice they're in reverse order. Let's see if I can get this junk off my screen. Um, all right, see if I can get this junk off my screen. All right. All right, so there are global and local variables. Now those are local variables, and you can tell from the way this works. These are stored in the local stack frame for this subroutine because I just pushed them onto the stack and that goes onto the immediate stack for this routine. So those are local variables, which means they're only available while you're in this routine and when you return, they will be gone. So that is the most common kind of variable and used for temporary storage only within one routine. But if you wanted to store something globally in your program and have it available to all modules, you'd have to store it separately in like the data section. And that would be gone yeah. and deleted or? There'd be, um, what they will do is the, stack will move elsewhere and they'll remain in memory as latent data until they make a new call and then it'll make a new stack frame and overwrite them. They're not, until that happens. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and they remain and that is how Target lost credit card numbers. If a RAM scraper stole them out of RAM and Microsoft does allow another variable type since 2004 in Visual Studio, you can define a different variable type and then it would not remain. Then it would erase it every time you're done right. using it, which would be a whole lot safer and that's what people should be using for passwords but at least as of a few years ago, nobody was bothering, and you could totally steal passwords from browsers in RAM. And that's, but yeah, it's a very good point. They are preserved with this kind of simple code. Yeah. Um, once I think some of the banking sites stored the password, 
in the Mac app store. Oh, really? If, saw, send, me, send me a link to that because that's hilariously bad. I mean, uh, putting any kind of sensitive data in the address bar is like one of the first things you should never do. Boy, that just What's that? that just I know. Well, the point is then it gets stuck in logs and error logs and in browser favorites. It's just thrown all over the place. That's a fundamental rule. That's why you're supposed to use post requests. You're not supposed to be putting anything sensitive in the address bar. But I've seen it. Not at bank sites, though. Yeah. Because the thing is, I'll, 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 I'll show it tomorrow when I come to class off camera. I don't want to do it off camera. Okay. Uh, when class is over or before class starts. Yeah, let's see it. Because um, it's I'm like, what the hell is this? You know what I'm well, you're absolutely right. That is outrageous. There should never be anything in the address bar that is sensitive. What most sites do is they have some long, meaningless number like cookie. But there shouldn't be anything you can understand that's important up there. Anyway, so... um. All right, so here's global and local variables. So here's one that has global variables, g equals two. And if you do that, then you'll see uh, that the global variable has a name like var four. And the other variable, uh, you just throw it on the stack. So, wait, uh, let me, excuse me, I'm getting it backwards. This is EBP plus var four. That is on your local stack. It's working from EBP. And so that's, here's the one that has more of a name called dword 41 b 1000 That's actually stored in another data segment, and it's a, therefore currently available. So actually, let me try making this one. I didn't put it in the project and do it before, but I think this is good to, whoa, let me see if I can get this garbage off my screen. All right, so let's, let's make this one. All right, and supposedly this thing will notice that I'm trying to, there we are. All right, so let's notepad. Maybe I do have it. Glob? I think I might. I, can. I do apparently have glob. Okay, let's notepad glob. Yes. Glob. It is unbelievably slow. This is presumably the City College Network punishing me for using a VPN. All right. Okay. Notepad, glob, okay, it is coming, all right. Good, so here we are. So now I have a global variable up here, g equals two, and then I have a local variable down here, looks like l equals three. So let's take a look at this one in Ida. So it's file, all right, there's some garbage happening here. File open, yes, I click file, and then I count, okay. Count to 10, it will notice me, open. The, the Google Cloud machine is plenty fast. This is just something wrong with the network here. And I'm not going to save the database and open Glob. Okay. All right. And then I accept whatever the defaults are for analysis. And here we go. So it shows me some junk. Then it finishes analyzing and moves to a graph mode of useless junk. And now I can close these useless panes over here. And now I can go hunt for the good stuff, which is view, open subviews, strings. All right. And now I can click the first string, and it will take me to the location where the first string is stored. And then I can go to the xref here and double click that, and it will take me to the code that uses the first string. And now, I've finally gotten to the actual code that does what the developer wrote. And so here you see it's going to print two things. Percent, here's the format string, and here's the call to some function that will presumably lead to print, and here's the other things being put on the stack. And the first push pushes EBP plus some number, so that's pointing to something on the local stack, and the next one points to D word 419000, so that's pointing to another area of memory. Um, this is at 401,000, and 419,000 is a data section. If you hover over it, it shows you there. This D word is stored off in a data section, and that's what you do for a global variable. It's stored elsewhere, so it will be preserved across all subroutines. All right, and then there's arithmetic operations, um, and there's quite a few of them. So if I set um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and floating point division, then you can watch all those happen here. So I define i, j, and i and j here to be three and six. 
So what this does is the first few commands create a new stack frame. Then you subtract 18 hex from this. This is how you create a stack frame of a certain size. You push the old EVP, you put ESP in the new EVP. So you begin a new stack frame at the next available location on the stack. Then you subtract something from the ESP. That gives it some size. So I have 18 hexadecimal words here, which is 16 plus 8, 24. Now I can store things. So EVP plus 8, which they're calling var 8 here, is 3. R4 is 6. Those are two local integers. And then I can um, put them in EAX and E and add to EAX, and then take EAX and put it here. So these three commands right here, where my cursor is, are this one line of C, it K equals I plus J. This is how you do an addition. Um, you cannot take an item in RAM and add it to another item in RAM and put the result in RAM all in one operation. And in ARM, you get used to everything being done this way. In ARM, everything has to be done with registers. And in Intel, it's often true as well. So that's what happens here. You have to put this in the register, then you add it, this into EAX, then you take EAX and put it back in the RAM. So that's what creates, and the K is also on the stack, so the destination is also EBP plus bar 18. Now, this one here, I'm gonna take a local variable and put it in ECX, and then subtract a local variable into ECX, and then take ECX and put it back on a local, different local variable, so that's what implements this J minus I operation. And in ARM, it would take even more steps because you cannot subtract something from RAM right into a register or add something from RAM right into a register. In ARM, you'd have to put them in registers and then add the registers. So down here, I pick a move, put something in EDX, and then I do a multiply, a variable in RAM with EDX. And that's integer multiplication, which is, again, just three lines of code. And this mesh here is the floating point division. And in Intel processors, there are special registers just for floating point variables. So that's what this garbage is, XMM0 and XMM1. And then it has DivivSS. So it has special functions and special registers just for floating point division, which is uh, pretty extreme, but that's how it works. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. In essence, programs can also store functions in a global variables. Um, you, you can't, I think, because they are not text sections, they're not executable. What you store is pointers to functions in global variables, I think, like libraries. Libraries are, in fact, stored in a different file and a different memory space, and you'll see them in memory map. If you look in, say, Ollie Debug, you can see your library is actually a different memory segment. Is there a way to specify what common function libraries are in global variables? Uh, it's a good question, and I don't really know the answer. If you do objdump minus r on Linux, you can see the relocation. It's done with two levels, and I know one thing you can do, you can control at compile time. You can compile on Linux, and I think you can do it on Windows too, you can compile static linking, which means it takes a whole copy of the library and attaches it to the executable, so you have your own library in your own memory space and then you'd know where it is. Normally, you have dynamic linking in Windows where the operating system hunts to find the library and links it in at runtime, so you're using a library that some other code may have, may have loaded earlier. And so this is, I think, these are decisions made at load time and at linking time, and you can actually compile things in different ways. These are very good questions. I don't have simple answers, but that is, that's a good level to think of it at. Um, all right, and here we got a branching if. So if you have here, um, just making sure people can see it. All right, so here I have int i equals 3, and then if i greater than 0, print something, or else print something else. So down here, I've got um, a local, again, I create a stack frame with push EBP and move EBP, um, move ESP into EBP. Uh, yes, ESP and EBP to start at the next available variable. Then I push something on the stack. That's my ECX. And then I put a three in there. That's actually kind of interesting. Remember, compilers will make weird decisions. Now, if it was me, I would have put three in the register and then pushed the register, but they did it the other way. Then I compare it to zero, and now I do a jump. If it's less than or equal, I call the green arrow. If it's not, I follow the red arrow. So it's, this is what you often see, a comparison or perhaps a test, and then a jump. Jump zero, jump not zero, jump less than equal, that sort of thing. There's a whole series of them. And so this is, then you push something here and call a print, or you push something else there and call a print. 
And that's it. And you need another jump at the end here, remember, because if you didn't have a jump here, then it would print positive and then also print negative. So you have to, if you want to do this code and skip over the next code, you're going to need a force jump at the end to skip over this code. So it takes a comparison, a jump, less than equal, and then another fixed jump to all add up to one if command. All right. And so here's for loops. So if you're going to have int i and then for i, i less than 100 do something, then there are four components in this line. You have to initialize i at zero. You have to compare it to see if it's less than 100. You have to execute the thing in the middle, and then you have to increment it. And then you'll have to have an if to decide whether it's time to uh, do more or go back. So here's an assembly code they had for that. So you initialize it here. This is a local variable on the stack, ebp plus bar 4. You put in 0, and then you jump to 16 down here. Now you do a comparison. Compare it to 100, which is 64 in hexadecimal. And if it's greater than or equal, then you go back to 2f. Oh, it's greater than or equal, then you're done. And you go to 2f off the page. If it's not greater than or equal, then you're ready. You move um, a variable into ECX, push ECX, and print something, and then add something. Anyway, that's the game here. And here's the increment. Now, I don't understand how before. Uh, then, then you jump here, jump to 401D. So then you jump up here, and now you're going to do the increment. I'm just trying to get used to my very strange mouse movement in this slow environment. All right, so this is where you add your counter. You add one to your counter, and then you go back here to compare your counter to 100 and decide again. So that whole mess is what a for loop looks like. And it shouldn't be too hard to read and understand this. And this is the kind of stuff you have to get used to. At first, like I say, you can do some reverse engineering even without being able to read the assembly by just looking at the names of the functions and the notes on the right. But to get a little further, you learn to spot a few common things, and then you, the further you go, the more you get better at it. This is like a little child learning how to read. Or first, you just look at the pictures, then you learn how to sound out a few simple words, and then eventually they learn more and more words and get better at it if they, if they keep working at it. So here's arrays. Here's an integer array with several elements. Um, int A5, and then you just assign them to something. Uh, right, you have two, you have a global array and a local array. B is global and A is local. And you've initialized them both to values. So here's the code for that. Okay, so I initialize. This is the local variable being initialized to zero. Uh, here I increment and compare. And now I'm going to assign it to values. And notice this one down here, the second to last command, is where I assign it to the global variable, which is 40A1000, which is stored in another data segment. All this stuff is 401,000 because it's in the text section um, running code. And this 40D1000 is the location of some kind of data segment where that one is stored, or 40A1000. So you can tell this is a global variable, not specific to this routine. And all these things, EBP plus something, those are local on the local stack frame that will be lost when I return. All right. So here's the summary of what we've done. When you want to find the code in IDA, my best technique is strings and then cross-reference. There probably is some other way, but that's how I find my way down to the code that's actually interesting instead of the boring, automatically generated Microsoft code. Uh, your function calls you should get used to. First, you push all the arguments on the stack in reverse order, and then you call the function. There's two kinds of variables, global, in memory and available to all functions, and in another memory segment, and local, on the stack, used only temporarily while you're in one function and lost when you return. And so to do arithmetic, you move your variables in registers, you perform arithmetic, and then you move the results back into the variable locations on the stack or wherever they are. In branching, you compare something, you have a conditional jump, and then you have two blocks of code, and one of them has an unconditional jump to jump over the other. All right. And I've got some cahoots here about that. So let me bring them up. This is 126, Chapter 6. So there it is. Should have some sound. OK. Good.
I got a message. Okay, let's see. Stay moving. Nope. I don't think so. Anyway, it's not a chat. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. But it, there could be some other process trying to get my attention, but it's not working. All right, let's see if I can get that to get bigger, maybe. Yeah. All right, we got it. All right, let's try it and see if this works. Got everybody in? No screams of protest. Okay. So what variables are on the stack? Okay, those are local variables. Good. All right. What C construct appears as three boxes connected by arrows? Okay, that's an if. All right. You have the first part that sets up the comparison and does a jump not zero, and then you have two possible boxes after that where you go if that condition is true or if that condition is false. What construct appears as several push commands followed by call? That's calling a function. You push the, the arguments on the stack and then you call the function. Which is why format string vulnerabilities work because you can call a function and if you did not remember to put the commands on the stack, it will just assume whatever's on the stack is the arguments. And so you can end up printing things that the developer didn't intend for you to print. So what construct looks like that? D word for one B housing. That's a global variable because it's pointing to a different section of memory, which is going to be a data section. Okay. So I've got WITB, which is Elon. Caitlin, and Vin might be a real name. I'm thinking it probably is. All right. And uh, so let me just take a look at the project that goes with this and mention a couple other things about projects. Um, here, let me just go back to, all right, so here we are. Um, this, the one that matches is this one, 304. Oh, here's the chat message we didn't see before. Well, that's because this computer hasn't read the chat message, but my other computer has. All right, so um, this one here is the one that directly matches this course, and I put the wrong title on it. It's not IDA Pro, it's C Construction Assembly, but it is using IDA. So all you do is you go through these things I just did in lecture, just for practice, and then to get your points, you have to do one, an unknown binary. You download this file and you have to disassemble it. And this file does some arithmetic. So you have to disassemble it in IDA Pro. You're just practicing a little bit how to use IDA. And you're going to find a flag in here. But you can see how it works. This is going to call a print. I always do the same thing. I recommend to you, I look on the right for something easy. So this is a format string for a print statement. So here it's printing four decimals and then a carriage return. And so up here, it's pushing things onto the stack. And you see here are, what kind of variables are these? I can't read them. Can't read them. Oh, that's not good. Well, that's, no, that's local that's because that's going from EBP plus VAR4. This is a global, 418,000, pointing to some of the, uh, so anyway, it has three local variables and a global variable, and it has some constants like 63 and C, and it just pushes them all in the stack and prints it. So this looks like a very simple C program that just defines some variables and then prints them. But anyway, you just have to open it up in IDA and find a value here uh, to get your points. Yeah. The flag of C. Yeah, that's the flag. Yeah, just that number there. So it's really just the value of a constant, nothing too dramatic, but it shows that you're getting some practice using IDA. Okay. 
And the other thing which I wanted to mention is that I figured out how to run Jasmine on the cloud. So I moved this project down here to either cloud or local. I had great trouble running Jasmine in the cloud and I finally figured out what's wrong, which I think someone told me a long time ago. There's another product named Jasmine, which is totally the wrong product. And my link going to like GitHub or wherever was downloading the wrong kind of Jasmine. So uh, there's a, ja a Java assembler called Jasmine and I linked to it. So now I got rid of it entirely, just linked to my copy of it. And then it is incredibly easy like it ought to be. The whole point of Java is to be platform independent. So you're just supposed, except for many times it doesn't work. The whole point of Java is you should be able to run it in any operating system, any version. And all you should have to do is to go to java.com, install the stuff there, and then run your Java. And in fact, that's all you have to do if you're downloading the right product which is nice. Unfortunately, I know a lot of products that require like a 64-bit only or 32-bit only and drive you nuts. But this product, um, that's all you have to do. So apparently the developers that made this simulator knew their Java well enough to write something that was properly uh, platform independent. So let me exit this one. And all you have to do, uh, is still closing Ida perhaps? Yeah, okay. So let me keep closing stuff. Get rid of all this old stuff. All right. The network don't like it, so. Well, yeah, I think it's something about the network and the VPN is strangely making everything slow. But being slow is actually not that bad a thing as long as it moves. So um, all I did was go to a browser and install Java, java.com. As a matter of fact, um, let's see if I can actually verify it. You used to be able to, but these days the Java component in your browser tends not to work. Um, there, I think it's, okay, control A, java.com, okay. There used to be a link, do I have Java? And here it is, let's see if this works. I think it's probably gonna give me a false reading though, because browsers no longer support Java easily. Let's see, do I have Java? Verify Java version. We have detected that you're using the 64-bit version of soft, which will not run the Java plugin. That's what I thought. Okay, so you can't find out this way, but you can find out by going to control panel and looking at programs. And I do have Java. So if you do have Java, all you have to do is download the jasmine.jar, which I did here. And let's see if I can make this view bigger. Oh, it's kind of ridiculous. That might work. So it should be Jasmine down here. And there it is. Jasmine 1.5 PC is what you want. It's just a jar file and it has the picture of the Java on it, the coffee cup. So if you double, double click it, then you get Jasmine. So it's bloody awesome. Um, this is my modified version where I took my grater's flowers and put them there instead of cheesecake, which was entertaining. If you want to replace images in jar files, it's incredibly easy. You just unpack them with zip and all the files are just sitting on like the web page. Replace the pictures, pack it back up with zip. It's wonderful. You don't have to. Is that the screen that comes on now? When you run? Yeah. Yeah, so you, is that politically incorrect one? Yeah, instead of the politically incorrect one. And I, I switched to this just because um, it's the right version. My other link went to some wrong version. So anyway, this point, it's really very easy. It runs on the cloud just like it runs anywhere else. So you can use Jasmine. And that's what should happen with Java code. It often doesn't, but it should happen. All right. And so there's one project related to what we've been doing here that I have to check, which is this MASM32. This MASM32 was another way to, was a way to assemble code. Microsoft has one. This is some third party one that looks like it was originally for MS-DOS, which worked pretty well. Um, but I haven't tested this one on server 2016 yet. That's why I'm going to do that soon and try to put it in the either 2008 or 2016. But this is a way to write direct assembly code in Windows and compile it. So you can now make code like this that has um, writes Hello World and so on. And we talked about this project before, writing assembler, but I haven't yet put it to the cloud. This semester, I'm hoping to get everything to the cloud so we can get rid of 2008 forever. And uh, all right. What's that? Go from there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they want to, I've also, so, you know, I'm, I remember in the first semester, I helped with a student trying to get local machine work, and I said, you know, I've so much had it with VMware and VirtualBox. I'm trying to eliminate them from my life entirely and put everything in the cloud because it is so annoying to get this, these junky desktop virtual heating programs to work.
I don't know why they still exist. Anyway, so um, are there any questions about it? Well, that's enough. You should have some homework to do. I'm going to stop the share and uh, hang around, see help. Any people want help on projects? I'll be back tomorrow for another class. A question on um, I was trying to use the, the Mac. Yeah. I couldn't um, install something. I had the, the username and the password. Where are the Macs in the lab? Oh, well, I think. Um, I sent you a text, or you could just sometimes you 